Thank you, Irvon. We have time for maybe one quick question. Okay, if not, we're gonna try and have a little bit of uh, uh, question and answer at the end of uh, the next talk. So, yeah, we're moving on to the uh, next speaker, Ricardo Tuttling, uh, providing a perspective from uh, NASA with a GEOS model. So Ricardo is gonna take us to the sky and beyond. Morning, everybody. Um... Thanks for uh, allowing me to speak here, and it's a pleasure to do that. And um, for me, particularly, um, so uh, um, I just want to say that at Goddard has been a conversation for a number of years about um, enabling uh, or producing or generating a, an internal model that would be a whole whole atmosphere type model, um, and Geo's being a strong candidate for that, obviously, but. Um, um, it wasn't until perhaps a year or so ago that we managed to at least have um, an agreement from higher up or, or an opportunity for higher up to show in the show in uh, um, what what we could benefit from and how we can benefit from that and uh, I can start a conversation that that uh, is now picking up uh, and becoming more serious and Fabrizio will actually um, Fabrizio Sassi will actually give you a better sort of a overall uh, perspective from, from the Goddard side of uh, the development of a uh, geos into a whole atmosphere model. I'm just gonna show, um, <clears throat> I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the progress that we are making integrating geos and into JEDI and, um, and give you a little bit of an example of what we did to demonstrate the capability uh, or what we expect as a benefit. So we flip this by, okay. So, so I'm just gonna the outline here, brief outline is just that this uh, I'll give you an overview of this transition from the present system, which is a G GSI based system, to a Jedi system. Um, concurrent development, which uh, we'll see what I mean by that uh, in, a, in a little bit, and um, talk about this sort of prototype uh, to uh, provide an example or, of what um, and how just can serve the purpose here. Um, and then uh, talk about, uh, give you a, a little bit of a, uh, so I'll use Sabre as a the proof of concept here, a simulation of Sabre, and then I close uh, with a few remarks. Um, so just to give a perspective for those who don't know, GEOS is a near uh, real-time operational system uh, that uh, it's, uh, it's, you know, obviously an atmospheric system um, that goes up to about uh, 80 kilometers. Um, uh, using uh, GSI as its analysis system. And it supports a number of applications. Uh, it's a higher resolution application near real time is a 12 kilometer system um, that um, that uh, has uh, 72 levels that, um, you know, again, the, all the systems actually have 72 levels presently. But we also have uh, different uh, resolution systems that provide support for reanalysis, for example. Um, we have one ongoing now, uh, MERA 21C, which is just... Uh, uh, sort of a mirror-like uh, uh, analysis, but just for the uh, for the modern era, um, for the more modern era, for the 2000s onward. Um, and uh, we also do OSIs, we do uh, uh, support for instrument teams, we do a variety of other applications in GEOS. It's configurable from its uh, sort of uh, sort of most modern uh, configuration as a hybrid uh, 4D and VAR system to a 3D VAR system. Uh, which is sort of some of the re older reanalysis are based on. So we are we are uh, presently we enabled our workflow to uh, to run from either GSI or JEDI, uh, and that's how we do tests and comparisons. Uh, ultimately, the final goal of this is to have uh, a system that's transitioned in many subcomponents to rely on GS uh, to uh, on the JEDI software, and also completely revising. That's why it, the background is turning to green from blue to blue green, completely revising that workflow into a more modern workflow that uh, that um, that um, uses, uh, that relies on Python and things that are sort of more more decent than the shell scripts that drive the system presently. So um, so it's modernizing the whole thing. So concurrent development by, by that, what I mean is that uh, we are so doing playing two games as many people are, we are, continue to develop our operational system in many ways, but we are also putting a lot of effort more and more. And so 
to migrate and to uh, to uh, accommodate and 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 eventually uh, fully integrate Jedi into our system. So we need uh, we are doing compressors one to one compressors, but at the same time, you know, evolving the system. So so one of the things that we are doing to sort of allow for these compressors to be fair is updating the version of the CRTM to one that's more consistent to uh, something that's available within the Jedi framework. So that's one of the things we're doing, but at the same time, we want to progress and the progress um, is for example, for us, uh, increasing the number of vertical levels that is a weakness in geos that we've known for many years, 72 levels that we have far from ideal. Uh, it has a substantial problem, particularly in the, in the, trop in the tropopause. Uh, so we you know we need to revise that. We have a new set, a 181 set of levels that we want to start using um, as soon as possible. So we are starting to test that. The model group is anxious to pass us a version. They claim to have it all nailed for us to use. Uh, we need the uh, corresponding analysis for that. Uh, so we are working into updating background errors and whatnot that's necessary for that. Um, we are also going to improve the physics of the model. The model group has a uh, tremendous uh, um, uh, revision of the physics package uh, involving radiation and, and, and many, many other things, uh, um, low level uh, uh, turbulence uh, and uh, um, um, gravity wave drag and, and uh, all major components of the model are being revised right now to support the 181 effort particularly, but also to give us better physics in general. And with that, we have to update our TLM and our joint models that support, uh, for example, our observation impact uh, work. And uh, and uh, at the same time, uh, the, in the Jedi side, we're trying to incorporate uh, the in the Jedi the pieces that we know are still missing, um, and we are in contact obviously and have the tremendous support of the Jedi group for doing things like aircraft bias correction that's still missing, uh, the tangent linear normal mode that's uh, on our side to actually um, uh, bring in from the GSI end, uh, skin analysis temperature uh, that that's also um, that we presently do in GEOS, but it's not in Jedi. Uh, dry mass constraint that we need uh, to uh, to add and and uh, ultimately start cycling not just the three divide that we've been cycling uh, with Jedi but also a 4D NVAR, which all the pieces are there. It's just a matter of um, having some of these other components in place. Um, so the fortunate thing is that a lot of the things that are being done on the left side here port automatically uh, to the to the right side uh, because of the infrastructure is common. So um, so that's uh, that's a good news. So when it comes to uh, to uh, developing and and and, and uh, transforming geos into a, a whole atmosphere model, we have been given this opportunity about a year or so ago to uh, come up with a sort of a demo or or, or prototype or whatever it is. And uh, so there's two concurrent efforts. I'm not talking about the second one. So there's one that's just the model itself and extending the model. And Fabrizio will talk a little bit more about that, uh, which is really. Uh, extending the top of the model and bringing it higher to the eight, from the 80 kilometers to 150 first and then beyond that. And, and there is uh, also the effort of, um, of um, just, you know, um, uh, doing the analysis side. So in, in the observations and all that. So um, in order to sort of illustrate a little bit, so what we came up with is the idea that, you know, we'll, we'll demonstrate the capability within GEOS, within the present GEOS and uh, what, for example, would be an improvement of the upper levels of the model, sort of in the mesosphere, uh, low stratosphere and mesosphere. You know, the mesosphere in our model is uh, just a little tiny piece, but uh, really the, st the, st the stratosphere. And so we came up with the idea of using um, saber observations to simulating saber observations and then illustrate prop improvements that we can obtain in that. So one of the um, ideas that we had is to just say, demonstrate this over something that's kind of already been done uh, within the MERA2, going from MERA to MERA2 system. So MERA and MERA2 are two reanalysis uh, using GEOS. Uh, they are different in model versions and, and details in the analysis and all that. We don't have to go through that here. But one of the things that happened is that uh, MERA2, I end up using MLS in the uh, in between five and, and sort of 0.1 uh, um, uh, millibars. Um, so, um, so MLS data, so to correct and, and have a better um, a stratosphere. And uh, one of the things that was uh, seen is that, for example, there was this case that uh, we knew from the MERA, from evaluations of MERA, that MERA wasn't representing very well with this uh, stratospheric, uh, sudden stratospheric warming event uh, that took place in February 2006. So that's the top panel 
here. Oops, sorry. I meant to press the other button, which is this thing. And uh, oh, that's interesting. This doesn't really point the right way. Yeah, I do, but it's kind of whatever. So the top plot is the mirror figure. And you see there is no real gap in there's the green to yellow there. There is no real gap in there. And it is known that this due is the stratospheric warming event. There is a breakdown of that of that uh, of that uh, temperature um, field. And the mirror two system assimilating um, MLS in the bottom shows that uh, that uh, breakdown uh, very uh, very nicely, and that has been shown to be then due to the assimilation of MLS. So we wanted to say to see whether, for example, we could do that with Saber, and Saber has the advantage of you know being a data set that goes well well beyond the the uh, 0.1 millibar that we're going to be using here. You know, goes well into and it's a data set that serves well. Uh, to a model that's going to be extended to 150 or so kilometers. So, uh, so in order to do that, we um, so you know we I just have a little blurb here about the Saber data and um, you know the nice thing about this data set, especially for reanalysis, uh, is that it goes all the way back to to uh, 2001. So it's a it's a very long record of uh, of, um, of of whatever it produces. You know, and it observes temperature. It observes also a lot of uh, you know CO2 and 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 uh, water and ozone um, and also uh, some of the atomic um, uh, elements like oxygen and hydrogen. So um, so we are using for this exercise this version 2.0, which is the uh, latest I guess version, the most recent version uh, that um, obviously you know it's being revised from the beginning to the present. Uh, and we are using it for this particular period of the 2005-2006 event. Uh, that I just uh, illustrated. Uh, this uh, slide is just here to show that there is a little bit of a subtlety uh, in using Sabre versus MLS. MLS has near pole to pole coverage um, um, throughout the year. Um, and uh, But Sabre is not quite that way. Sabre has, because of a satellite maneuvering, Sabre uh, changes every 60 days. It changes its hemispheric view um, so you kind of have to be careful if you're going to evaluate a particular event. You have to make sure that uh, there is coverage, you know, over the event that you're interested in. Luckily, in this case, and uh, the figures here illustrate that. So the top two figures are MLS for say January, someday in January, sometime in January, and uh, another one in February on the on the on the right. And at the bottom one, you have the corresponding ones for Saber. And you can see that Sabre in January, in this particular time in January, is really looking at the Southern Hemisphere, uh, you know, in the tropics, obviously. Uh, whereas uh, luckily in, in, at the end of uh, January, it actually flips and starts looking at the area of interest. So it actually does apply to what we are sort of after here. So, um, you know, we did a little preliminary testing to make sure that you know, we can assimilate uh, Sabre and that things would it make sense. So uh, the figures here show in the solid curve is the standard deviation of the uh, observation minus uh, uh, background fits. Uh, so, and how well the observation fits the, the model. Uh, so the solid curves are the standard deviation of that and the, the dash curves are the, the, the means, just the differences um, averaged over this region between minus 50 and 50 where the both data sets are common. Um, so they have common coverage, uh, more or less. Um, so, and you can see that uh, the leftmost plot here is what happens when both data are being taken into the system passively, which means they're not affecting, they're not being assimilated. Then the middle one is when MLS is assimilated, but not Sabre. And you can see that the fact that MLS is assimilated brings down the standard deviation and strengthens up the mean of also Sabre that's being, that's being um, carried along. And when we flip and reverse and, and assimilate Saber, but not MLS, which is the far right plot, the same thing happens. So uh, you know, the data that's not being assimilated also takes the benefit from that improved background. So it's, it's just a little bit of a, a sanity check really, because we know this is the kind of thing that should happen, but, uh, but it's good to know that you know it's happening. So what I have then here is I have, uh, unfortunately an ongoing experiment, which is at the bottom here, uh, and you know, I just updated this figure earlier this morning at eight thirty in the morning um, um, uh, in the in the website here. 
to just get the whatever you know my experiment is uh, producing. But so the top plot. So what we had to do here is uh, instead of comparing with merit two, uh, we have a better version or sort of an improved version, if if I would say, I'm a modern version of merit two, which uses a more modern model and revised the GSI components, et cetera, et cetera. And this is the version that we use. I uh, have been running now since uh, that's covering from the, the early 90s or the late 90s, I'm sorry, to the present. And it's a version that we, we call GeosIT, which is uh, used for the instrument teams to support instrument teams, the NASA instrument teams, which they have, they don't really want to see our operational product because uh, the operational product is a lot of times using data that they actually trying to validate their own, uh, their own instruments. So they usually request us to remove some data from, from our system and then run, run a system that's just specific for them. And that's what GeosIT is, uh, you know, and in this particular case, it doesn't have MLS, which makes it then just from this perspective, similar to Mara. So when you can kind of see from the top plot there that similarly to Mara, there is no real gap in that, in that, that top yellowish and greenish uh, set of contours of temperature there, where there is really, you know, there is no, it's not, it's not a system that's capable of catching this breakdown um, um, due to the um, sudden warming, um, um, stratospheric so the sudden warming. So the hope is that the saber being assimilated in the bottom plot here will uh, be, will actually show that breakdown. And you can kind of already see, it's already hinting at the fact that it is breaking down because that yellow, the yellow contour there, that stronger yellow contour at the end uh, here is not showing up. And uh, you don't even see the 250 uh, um, uh, Kelvin uh, contour appearing. So, so Kevin uh, uh, Saber is doing a similar job as uh, as uh, MLS is, and again, you know, but Saber has this advantage of really being uh, we've been able to use it and push it uh, much further up. And when when we do um, use a model that goes, uh, you know, that has the top extended. So just to just as a side note, I guess uh, you know I you know it's it's been there's some study being done showing that saber um, is uh, saber temperatures are are very much in line with the retrieved temperatures or the temperatures that uh, GPS RO produces, and so uh, which is uh, kind of an interesting thing. So we could explore it further. Um, and take this effort, even within the context of what we presently have, an 80 kilometer model, to try and see, you know, what what effects would be uh, if we were to use or at least carry along and look at a period where we have GPS more intensely. The 2006 period is not a good period for that, but uh, but uh, the more, more, more modern period and see what the interplay would be between using Saber and uh, and the GPS, uh, if not passively to sort of verify the GPS usage, but also to uh, I have to even assimilate that. So um, saber together and see what we get from that. So with that, you know, I close it and we go early to coffee, um, which I just want to say that, um, so we, we kind of have this, we're trying to uh, come up with this prototype, uh, at least demonstrate, have a first demonstration. We, we're given a year for this demonstration, which I think we're going to, you know, we're finishing time to be able to say, okay, here we've done this and hopefully we'll get the blessing from the, from the, um, from the uh, management that uh, that we can then proceed to a sort of a more um, uh, uh, ambitious uh, objectives that uh, Fabrizio will lay out later. later and, and there's a multiple uh, proposals being uh, done along those lines. And uh, so again, you know, we are uh, doing the best that we can to migrate to Jedi. And I think that this particular thing that we're doing here, that I just showed illustrated here, putting Saber in Jedi, is nearly a no-brainer because it's uh, it's it's uh, it's a retrieved data set, it's a retrieval uh, data set, and uh, there's plenty of examples of things like that. They've already there, they're already there. MLS, for example, is one of them, and uh, and I think that uh, you know taking this into Jedi is not a not a problem. Uh, obviously, this opens the door for other data sets that we want to use uh, within this context. Um, and uh, I just say that, you know, if when and when we start going into extending the model and having to revise the background error covariances for the analysis, I mean, the beauty of what we have right now is that uh, if we do that in the present system, in the GSI based system, because it's what we can truly experiment with fully, um, it's okay because when time comes and we have a fully uh, implemented GeoS Jedi, 
porting that to that system, both the model and its increased levels and the analysis, and the analysis background error and the change there should be rather straightforward because of the framework that, that we're embracing in this transition. And again, you know, please uh, listen to uh, Fabrizio later on and uh, more sort of a complete view of our plans in, within GIOS. That's all I have. Yeah, please, Thank you, Ricardo. Uh, we'd like to open it up for questions to any of the speakers that we just heard from for a couple of minutes before the break. So we'll push a little bit into the break, um, but I did, uh, I was aware that there might have been some questions for either Sue Wei or uh, Irfan or Ricardo. So let's let's have a couple of minutes of questions. Please use the mics uh, to uh, make sure people online can hear them. Uh, making us wait till afternoon uh, discussion. So there's more question for Sue Wei uh, about you know using ionosphere observation for you know 